to take over the moderator role now. Uh, I'll just note that I echo your praise for Thomas Malone's book, Supermind. I found it fascinating for exactly the same reasons you've picked out. And I wanna thank you for highlighting the book by Joseph Henrik, The Secret of Our Success. I think I'll be adding that to my list as well. Mark, do you want to take over? Uh, yes, um, uh, I have the, the pleasure to introduce the, the next and last uh, speaker, <laughs> David. Uh, just a, a remi reminder uh, before to leave you the, the floor. Uh, you remember that after the, the, that uh, David uh, will have speak, we will have um, about uh, one hour to try to work in the workshop on the Viridian Manifesto. And so we are still asking you, and you can start to uh, indicate in the chat room uh, the, the workshop uh, you would uh, um, prefer to work on. Uh, I uh, remember that uh, the, the possibilities, well, just uh, uh, we are now something like uh, 20, 23 people. I think we will not have four, but three uh, workshop. The first one, uh, will be social and institution, the second one energy, and the third one ecosystem and health. So uh, please indicate uh, your preferences uh, with, uh, by, by those uh, possibilities. And now, thank you, uh, David, uh, for your presentation. Thank you so much. So as you heard, my name's David Wood, and my topic is going to be uh, super democracy as the key enable of the Viridian future that some of us have been talking about. And I'll be cutting some corners in my talk, but you can find me afterwards if you don't know me already, Google David Wood Futurists, or on Twitter, I am at DW2. Start by looking at the last 250 years or so. And I will argue that at a broad level, that period of time has seen generally increasing human flourishing. People's lives have been longer on the whole and healthier. There has been more education, more human rights, more travel, more consumer items. At the same time, the technology has given us not just this greater flourishing, it has given us greater potential for damage, accidental damage, or intentional damage. But we're here to look not at the past, we're here to look at what might happen in the next few decades. If I look ahead to roughly the middle of the century and look at some key scenarios that might lie ahead, most people, if they don't think about things very much, tend to assume that history will more or less continue. Of course, some things will change, but by and large, it will be an extension, business as usual. There might be some acceleration or there might be a slowdown. For example, life, average life expectancy might decrease due to greater deaths of depression and so on. But I'm here to say that I don't think any of that range of scenarios is very likely. I rate it collectively as a, only about 10% chance. And what is much more likely is something that John mentioned, which is that due to the increasing factors that are at, at loose, we might tip downwards with some kind of social collapse and environmental tragedy, a humanitarian catastrophe. Why? Because the powers that will be put in our hands mixed with our existing human nature at the individual and social structures can do a great deal of harm. And I rate that at least one third likely. If you add up the numbers, you'll see there's still around a 55% chance of something different, something significantly different which is what I tend to think is most likely to happen, which is that we can take advantage of the nanotech, biotech, green tech, infotech, and cognotech to reach something which previous generations would almost call a kind of paradise, a sustainable abundance or sustainable superabundance for all. But that's by no means certain. And the task of all of us as futurists transhumanists or whatever, is to figure out how to decrease the probability of that very bad scenario and increase the probability of this uh, wonderful scenario. 
And broadly, there are three steps involved. We have to understand what might cause the collapse, the forces that are loose that are causing fear, outrage, collective stupidity, and so forth. But more than just dealing with these negative forces, much more important is to paint more clearly a vivid, positive vision of a techno-progressive transformation in which no one is left behind against their will. And to help with this is a matter of spelling out the most important values, as we have to take lots of hard decisions in the years ahead about priorities, what are the things that matters most, and we need to clarify that as never before. And I claim this is what we might call a transhumanist values. And although this is a transhumanist conference, there hasn't been much said about transhumanism so far. So I'm going to take this opportunity of saying that the most important insight of transhumanism, in my view, is that human nature needs to be improved. Now, many people don't like that idea. They say that human nature is precious and should not be tampered with. And although we have foibles and eccentricities and uh, foolishness, that's all part of the package. And if we were to try and change this, bad things will inevitably happen. Some people say that our human nature is divinely created. Others will say it comes from a long, difficult, complicated process of evolution, which ultimately is wise. But transhumanism disagrees. Transhumanists say it is careless, reckless, blasé, just to leave our human nature as it is when we have all these very powerful technologies increasingly at our disposal. So we transhumanists see human nature as a mix of features, some of which should be preserved, some of which should be improved and enhanced, and others which should be restricted or limited, or we might say transcended. And some people say, well, in, in principle, we're probably right, but they hate the idea of people taking these decisions on others' behalf. And we transhumanists say, we are not in the business of making these decisions ourselves. We want to encourage what we might call the best of humanity 1.0 to come together and collaboratively figure out how we can get to what humanity plus the organization call a humanity plus future. And that involves assembling the best insights of all kinds of scientists, but also the insights from multiple different cultures, enhancing that with uh, creative imagination, and then critically evaluating it by the collective wisdom of humanity 1.0. And that's difficult, and that's challenging. But if we sh run away from that challenge, we are very likely to end up in the collapse scenario, which I highlighted. So stage by stage, we can address these issues. And if that sounds a bit abstract, let me try and make it a bit more concrete. Transhumanists sometimes talk about three supers, or sometimes about four supers. And in each case, there are ways in which we will transcend some of the bad aspects of human nature that we have inherited, either from evolution, or from our culture and uh, sociology, or from the philosoph philosophical ideas that are lying around. So the four super, super longevity, super intelligence, some transhumanists talk about super happiness, more of us should, and a few transhumanists, and a lot more should, also talk about super democracy. Super longevity means overcoming the inherited nature in our biological bodies to decay and become decrepit. We can overcome these by wisely using rejuvenation biotechnology. Super intelligence refers to the fact that we have lots of drawbacks in our thinking, cognitive biases, blind spots, collective stupidity, we might say. And much of that made sort of sense in ancient Neolithic times, there were rules of the thumb that helped us to get by, but they are very dangerous now. And we must augment that with artificial intelligence and technologies for collective intelligence. Our emotional selves are planted by evolution, not to make us happy. Evolution was not interested in making us happy particularly. It was just interested in us doing what was necessary to propagate our genes. And we therefore have lots of tendencies towards egotism, depression, alienation, and so forth, which we can address in multiple ways, but in part by taking advantage of transformative technologies of Cognotech, which takes me to super democracy. 
it takes us to recognizing that many aspects of our human nature are built out in social relationships. And we do tend for evolutionary reasons to fear different people. It sort of made sense historically. We have tendencies to divisiveness, tendencies to deceive other people. One of the reasons our brains got so large, people think, is because we needed to keep track of who was deceiving who and who knew who was deceiving whom. And that's not very flattering, but it's at least part of the reasons why our brains grew. And we are also very prone, once we've got power, to abuse it. Well, we can address this too, enhancing diversity, very importantly, as uh, John Danaher was just talking about. This is not just about doing one thing and doing one thing again and again. Enhancing our liberty, protecting social inclusion and resilience. And I'm going to say a bit more about that. But first, actually, there are five dimensions, in my view, of what transhumanism is about. And I will add it to the rejuvenation of our body, the rejuvenation of our minds, the rejuvenation of our emotional selves, and the rejuvenation of our political structures. I will add the rejuvenation of human vision something that will avoid us from being bogged down in small mindedness, in pettiness, in tribal visions. And this is the transhumanist techno progression vision of a sustainable superabundance ahead if we are wise enough to see it and grasp the opportunity. And I believe that what will help a lot of humanity get out of its present state of a dysfunction is sharing this credible, inspiring, engaging and inclusive vision so I talk about super narrative as well. And part of that narrative is to think about the future of politics. And I'll start with this statement, which isn't a definition of super democracy. It is a famous definition of democracy from, amongst other places, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And let's just dive into this a bit and then see how transhumanism will enhance it. There are three clauses. There is the government of the people. Government means that people are actually organized and have some restrictions put on them, on us. We can't always decide by ourselves what we want to do. We can't decide by ourselves. This wasn't Lincoln's analogy, but uh, we can say it now. We can't decide by ourselves how much we can drink before we drive. We can't decide, each of us by ourselves, how fast we can drive a car, where we can take dangerous items such as uh, firearms, nor should we be able to decide entirely by ourselves what pollutants we emit. Government of the people by the people. By the people means representatives of the people. Some of them are there in professional capacity like the civil service and the judges, but the most important ones are elected and vital are subject to removal in elections. And when this works well, the elected representatives take advice from the entire population, not just the loudest voices and get advice, not just at the times of elections. The third clause, democracy for the people, for all the people. It's not just for an elite, a 1% or so. It's not just for any special complexes that follow their human nature and try to grab on to power and privilege. So presidents have warned us against the military industrial complex. We are warned against big pharma, big agrotech, big uh, oil, uh, big media tech as well. Uh, we are warned against allowing too much power for the press balance, and certainly we have to watch out for politics being operated just in service of the politicians. So that is what I think Lincoln and others had in mind. And the big issue with democracy, of course, is it puts a very heavy reliance on people. And you may have heard this argument against democracy it's a five minute conversation with the average voter, which is sometimes said to be a quote from Churchill, though Churchill's foundation denies that he ever said such a thing. Nevertheless, we can well imagine it. And we are sometimes horrified at what our fellow average voters express. And for democracy to flourish and to fulfill its mission, we need people to be 
autonomous, not to be easily misled by all these complexes, the big pharma, the military, the press who will guide us, lead us astray. We need people to have a basic education in critical thinking and historical examples and indeed in foresight. And we need people to be better supported. Is that enough? So some transhumanists give the impression that we will have better politics because we will have in due course people who are better politicians, better voters, better press, better analysts, and so on. But I'm here to say that is not enough. And we have to modify this. It is government of the people. This is just the first of several modifications of the statement by the people aided by technology and aided by institutions. And it's for the people. Aided by technology means that we will use technology to do things like real-time fact checking, real-time logic checking, source checking, to highlight more clearly and more quickly when politicians and others are making fake claims. The AI should also help to synthesize different views. It's not just being critical, it's offering compromises. And it's also allowing simulations of possible policies to be run so we can see more clearly ahead of times what is likely to be happening. But even that is not the culmination. I want to highlight in my last minute or so, the two most vital inventions in my view, in some ways from the last 250 years, they are the vital invention of the mixed economy and the vital invention of separation of powers. The mixed economy means we realize that the free market can do wonders. It can allow lots of innovation to take place. We don't tell people who they should work for. We don't fix the prices centrally. But we do recognize that the free market moves into failure modes from time to time, so left under its own steam, and we therefore need to steer it. That is the free market governed by democracy. And it involves not just innovation in products, it also requires innovation in regulations. Today's regulatory systems and subsidy systems and externalities are not well managed and we need to hurry up and improve how that works. We need to apply innovations in management to the management of politics. We need better industrial strategy and the freedom of the press must be subject to the same kind of constraints that we have for freedom of advertising, which is that advertisers that knowingly lie should be subject to penalties. And if I had more time, I could talk about using some of these technologies to enhance new institutions, such as citizens assemblies, liquid voting, reputation systems, and so forth. So briefly, transhumanism, it's a vision of, yes, a better world with better humans, but also structured in new ways, not dramatically different ways, ev evolving where we are today, going back to this vision of uh, separation of power and the mixed economy and making it work with the best of new technology. And that will improve our environment too. And transhumanism isn't just an abstract vision. It is a set of policies, ideally to develop technologies, but also to develop these institutions to steer politics and very importantly, to spread insight via education, such as the very important Humanity Plus initiative, Transhumanist Studies, which is now gathering pace. It's a community and it's an ethical framework that will help us take these hard decisions. I've cut a lot of corners in my rushed 16 minutes, but you can find more details from my books and I will now hand back to Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, and did I think I, we are uh, a little bit late? So uh, I think that the, if there are uh, questions for David, it could be uh, better to answer or during the the, the uh, 